actually, uh, I have designed this talk for a little bit. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, somebody who doesn't have a background in magnetism might feel a little bit. Uh, I mean, not doing research in magnetism might feel a little bit uh, out, but I hope that it should be fine. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. So by the way, I have a question for you. Um, is it uh, d so for to meet the expert, does it need to be somebody who is in uh, the quantum science center or can it be somebody who is tangentially related? Can be anybody? Uh, we, we can have speakers outside of the quantum science center. Yes. So there is actually so, somebody from IBM who is doing some very exciting research on mm -hmm. uh, manipulating AFM some uh, magnetic materials with AFM tips. And uh, uh, I can forward you a paper which he has published and uh, then we can mm -hmm. discuss if. Uh, that would be great. Yes. Um, uh, do, do you know this person? Uh, so okay. could you help? So if you could help to establish the contact, that would be great. And then of course I will be happy to provide all the details about our seminar and see if we have uh, later this spring uh, uh, slots available. Fantastic. Great. There, can you, Thank you. Can you hear? Uh, I'm sorry, could you please repeat? So can you can you hear me? And uh, yes. Zach, I think you could you please uh, mute? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, Arnav, could you please repeat? Okay. Um, I don't, it's it's tough to hear you. If you could maybe turn up the volume um, or something. Kind of is this uh, cleaner? Yes. Now I I, I can hear you. Better. Yes. That's better. All right. I think time is five or two, and we can uh, slowly begin. So it's a great pleasure to have today. Have today. Uh, oh, I can hear myself. All right. It's a great pleasure to have today Arnab Banerjee. Uh, he is an assistant professor in physics and astronomy. Uh, at Purdue University and also a guest scientist at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Uh, he's an expert on the behavior of spins and exotic nature of uh, magnetism in matter. And for his recent research, he was focusing on trying to find new quantum phases of matter and quasi-particles in magnetic materials using uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory facilities and also collaborating with uh, D-Wave companies and IBM and trying to see if this, uh, in his research, these materials can offer uh, future device engineering uh, and fault tolerant quantum platforms. So I think today Arnav will present his uh, uh, interesting research and experience working both with uh, national laboratory and uh, big enterprises uh, on uh, his research. Uh, uh, Arnav, thank you so much uh, for joining and floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I will apologize saying already that I have a lot more slides than what I think I can present because it's quite a breadth of things here. So I will try to touch up on many of these, but also try to give you a introduction. Uh, and um, uh, of course, you uh, please feel free to email me, uh, any of you uh, at rnfp at purdue.edu and we can also set up discussions where we can hone in on each of these topics. Today I will go a little bit fast, but I hope that you get the main message, which is that uh, I will be talking about conventional spin system, exotic spin systems, some neutron scattering studies, and some very interesting ongoing work with IBM and D-Wave as uh, Sasha just mentioned. And I hope that the message that you get is that these emergent states of magnetism 
that I will be talking about produces uh, very new and exotic states of matter which hold a tremendous amount of untapped potential for future applications. So we start with uh, asking what are spins? So spins are essentially unpaired electrons or a cluster of unpaired electrons. And, but uh, when we talk about spins, we also talk about their orbital motion. So the effective J that you have is equal to L plus S. So you take the combination of both. But uh, for practical purposes, what we would assume is that, let's say that the electron, you know that the electron has a spin angular moment, um, which actually in part S is equal to half. It is almost like a bar magnet with a, you can think of a north and a south. And when we think of spin systems, it will be essentially a bunch of these bar magnets which are in the material, which are these unpaired spins. And how can you get to unpaired spins? The way you get to unpaired spins is uh, in a certain material. What you find is that it depends on how much their orbitals are really filled out. So for example, if you are looking at the native state, states of these transition metal ions, what you find is that, for example, chromium has uh, one single uh, electron in its outermost shell, copper has one. So these will all be magnetic. But if you have, let's say, chromium three plus, that will also be magnetic because that will have a odd number of unpaired electrons in the 3D, which will redistribute itself. So as long as you have this odd number of electrons in the outermost shell, it will essentially be like a bar magnet. Uh, uh, is what we really call spins, and the final state will be J is equal to L plus S. So when we are talking about spins, we talk about non itinerant spins, and this is uh, what it means is that it's not that you have spins which are kind of floating around everywhere. I mean, uh, that's not what we have. What we have uh, actually looks more like, uh, I would say, this Buddhist prayer reads, where what you find is that the spins themselves are all fixed in uh, places. They can rotate in various directions, but they are, the electrons themselves don't move. So you basically have non-itinerant spins, which means that you have to have, uh, the system has to be an insulator. It's not that the electrons are just moving around like in a matrix and can wander off. So that's what we are talking about. We are talking about non-itinerant spin systems. And in this non itinerant spin systems, uh, as you know that we can get spin states of matter. Like in uh, um, in, in, a, in case of normal matter, you get uh, states of matter. For example, if you reduce the amount of thermal motion, what you get is that you can go from a gaseous state where nothing is really interacting to a liquid state where there is some uh, low energy interactions to a solid state where their interactions are so strong that everything kind of freezes and are strongly bound into some crystalline shapes and you get a solid. That's what you also get in spin systems. You basically at high, high temperature, you get something like a spin gas where all the directions of the spins are basically all random. They're moving around. And then when you reduce the temperature, what you get is a spin liquid state. And in the spin liquid state, uh, just like in a normal liquid, there are some orderly motions and um, the spins are not as free to move around the, like you get in a paramagnet. Uh, and, and I will come to the spin liquid state in a, a lot more detail later. And then when you reduce the temperature more, what you get is uh, a finally a spin solid, which can be an example of a ferromagnet or an antiferromagnet or a, a ferry, ferry magnet, just like this. So at higher temperature, and these are the states of matter that we already know about, at high temperature, what we get is basically a spin gas, which is like a paramagnet, and that is when the temperature scale is much, much greater than the energy of interaction between the spins. But when you reduce the temperature, if you have, uh, depending on the sign of this interaction, if this is negative, you basically get a ferromagnet. If this is positive, you get an antiferromagnet, and you get some if you have some mixed J's, you get something called a ferry magnet. And these happen below the new temperature. This happens below the uh, uh, Curie temperature. And all of these happens at low temperatures when the overall temperature scale is lower than the interaction in between the spins that you get. And then there is an application that you already know of these uh, spin systems is that of solid state memory. 
where you know that the whole concept of a solid state memory uh, actually rests on this concept of protection. What is protected? It's the ground state which is protected. What does it mean? It means that uh, when it becomes a when you have a non-magnetic state and then when you kind of freeze the spins out, it becomes a ferromagnet and all the spins kind of point in certain directions. And if you have an interaction which makes that point in that way, even if you flip one spin, the overall state of the matter is still a ferromagnet, which means that the information which is contained in this ensemble of spins is actually preserved. And that is exactly what is the main guiding principle of a magnetic memory is that you basically have protection that even if you flip one spin by mistake or because of some randomness, your overall memory is still kind of uh, preserved. What it means is that essentially your memory is uh, protected by what we call is an energy gap. And for, for a spin to basically go from the up state to the down state, you have to go across an energy gap. So an energy gap is something which protects uh, the memory state here. And this is one application that we know of. However, uh, this is the, not the only state of matter, um, spin state of matter that we have. We have several, several other spin states of matter. Well, we know about ferromagnets, but we can also have antiferromagnets. We can have liquids, gases. But when you go to the quantum, these are all classical or semi-classical description of spins. Uh, but when you go to the quantum description of an ensemble of spins, you get several, several more kinds of states of matter. For example, you get superfluid states, you get liquid, uh, quantum liquid crystals, quantum skirmion lattices, you get something called spin liquid or an orbital liquid and spin superfluid states. You get a plethora of new states of matter when, uh, when you actually have these quantum fluctuations. So then the question is that how do we understand all these phases and how do we uh, get to all these phases and use all these phases? And uh, the answer is that let's first try to understand them and hopefully the applications will offer themselves to us. So, uh, so to understand what these quantum states really are, something that we know about quantum states is that a quantum, one, of, one of the hallmarks of quantum states is that it, you have to have quantum fluctuations and you have to have quantum fluctuations of multiple spins and that's what is the hallmark of a quantum state. And, uh, and what it means is that even when you decrease the temperature below the, uh, below the uh, interaction strength of the spins, the spins do not freeze to a solid state. They still keep on fluctuating very strongly and all of these motions are very entangled. And uh, that is basically what is a quantum state. And so basically you get a very, very dynamic state of matter. And uh, so that's basically the would be a quantum state of spins. And in the quantum state of spins, the spins themselves are very entangled. And what does that mean? What it means is that, for example, if you take just two spins, let's say, uh, two spins and they form an entangled pair, the simplest, the simplest uh, uh, construct of an entangled pair is a spin dimer. So what is a spin dimer? A spin dimer is one where none of the spins actually keep their own identity. The spins themselves lose their identity. They are so entangled that now you just have one single uh, dimer quasi-particle, uh, which is basically called a singlet. And the singlet can basically uh, go into a new state called the triplet, and this uh, this singlet state is basically protected by this uh, delta, which is also called the triplet gap. So, the new states of this double spin configuration is basically the singlet state, which is, as you can see, it's a completely entangled state of these two spins, and then a triplet state, and there are three possible triplet states. As, and as you can see, it is uh, uh, one by square root of two, up, down, plus, down, up, 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 down, down. And you cannot really talk about these spins separately. You cannot really take one spin out and still define this singlet and triplet state. So basically now your basis, you cannot speak in the spin basis anymore. You have to speak in the basis of singlets and triplets. And so that is an, an example of an entangled state. But when you have entangled states, some very interesting things happen. 
For example, if you have a chain of such entangled spins, then a small uh, interchain interaction cannot destroy this gap. So if you, for example, have a J interaction between the spins and you have J prime uh, between these uh, dimer couplings, then this J prime uh, cannot actually destroy these dimers or can fill up this gap unless this J prime is as big as J. That means that your gap is now protected at least up to a value of J. You can also get something very interesting, which is this concept of fractionalization, which is that uh, the ends of this spin chain, even though if it's a spin one chain, the ends of the spin chain will be spin half, spin halves because, of, because uh, there is no other system on the right here on the left here and in the right here for this spin to interact with. So basically at the ends, you basically get this protected spin half states, which are also called the edge states. And uh, this is one of the simplest construct of an edge, edge mode that we have uh, coming from a spin system, which is uh, also, it's famously, it's the AKLT model, uh, the Affleck, Yeb, uh, Lieber, and uh, I forgot the T. Uh, model. So, um, so you get this concept of rationalization, and the other thing that you get is that you don't have magnets anymore. You don't have like spin waves anymore. What you have is that if the spins have to propagate, that is, if the spins have to change directions, the way to do it is by the propagation of something that we called a spin-on. So what a spin-on is, is that you have to basically go all the way across this gap delta in order to create a spin-on. If you want to flip a spin, you have to go from the singlet state all the way to the triplet state by flipping the gap. And that is when you can actually move this uh, spins around and you, you basically get dynamics. So, so basically, if you have to kind of mix all these states, you have to at least cross this gap. And that, so that is basically what uh, lends to this concept that you have uh, protected, you have a gap protecting the system and you have fractional excitation. So, those are some of the very interesting things which come from an entangled quantum state. But how do we get there? To one of the, so the the one of the most important ingredients of um, uh, getting there is called spin frustration. So what is spin frustration? Let's say, let's say that you have an Ising antiferromagnet, uh, which means that uh, if one spin is up and the other spin is down then the energy of this Hamiltonian is minimized. Now, if you have a, this a triangular motif, what you find is that uh, if uh, one spin is up, one spin is down, if the other spin is down, then this bond is not satisfied. And, but it, if, if it is up, then this bond is not satisfied. So there is no real way you can completely minimize the energy of the system. And this whole system is now called Frustrated. Why? Because this spin really cannot decide which way it wants to point. And, and that is actually very important because what this means is that if you have a large frustration, what it means is that the force to disorder is more than the forces to order. And whenever you have these disordering forces winning out, you have more quantum entanglement. And as you could see that you get basically get several possibilities. I mean, you, this can be up or down, this can be up or down, this can be up or, up, or, up or down. So just from a triangular motif, you have come to six different spin configurations that you have. And these ground states are all highly degenerate. They have the same energy and none of them is really the lowest ground state. So basically, uh, uh, none of them is really, really all satisfying the Hamiltonian. And so that is basically the main ingredient of uh, getting to a highly quantum entangled state. And how, for example, if you have such a triangular motif, you take this triangular motif and then you make a much larger lattice, for example, a Kagome lattice, where you have this, let's say this triangle, this triangle, uh, inverted triangle, triangle, inverted triangle, all of these spins here are frustrated. And the overall ground state is basically composed of spin dimers, which are the satisfied spins, satisfied uh, spin dimers, and then a lot of the spin dimers which are not satisfied. And then basically now you have made this ground state, which is basically a dumb ground state of the spin dimers. And, and as you could see that this solution is uh, looks very different from these solutions because a separate set of uh, a separate set of dimers are satisfied, but these have the same energy. So all of these ground states 
are highly degenerate. So basically, the, the example that I showed you is, is something that we get in Kagome, that is in Herbert Schmidtite, and it has a very high degree of spin fluctuations. But these are not the only states that you would get if you have uh, strong spin fluctuations. So you can also get something called spin ice. So in the largest limit, what you have is that if you have such a frustration, then in the largest limit, the system can actually decide to kind of align in a way so that the spins are all 120 degrees apart. So if they're 120 degrees apart in direction, they can all be pointing out or they can all be pointing in. This is called an all out. This is called an all in. So this all in all out configuration is actually very interesting because if you have a lattice and you have this bunches, this like plethora of all in all out configurations and the system freezes, then what you get is something called the spin ice, which has uh, a lot of these all in all out configurations. And, and there are materials in which you can actually get these interesting states. An example is dysprosium titanate, where you basically get this all in all out configurations, which people have actually measured. Real, people have really gone uh, uh, and measured this all in all out configurations. And But not only that, you can also construct this all in all out configurations, for example, in, using a D-wave machine, where in a square lattice, you can also get this all in all out type configurations. But this all in all out configurations really act as a positive and magnetic center and a negative magnetic center, and these act like monopoles. And uh, what you find is that in these uh, very interesting states of matter, these monopoles are all separated by something called Dirac strings, and you get very highly separated monopoles, which is basically an emergent quantum behavior, which is very interesting. You can also get skormions in presence of a chiral magnetic interaction, where skormions, as you, uh, some of you might know that they, these are basically a cluster of spins, which has an overall topological winding number. Uh, what this means is that if you take if you basically take the phase of the spins and then you wind across one of these structures, you basically get a, you basically get an integer phase. And so, uh, so basically, these are what uh, skormions are. And if you have quantum fluctuations, this can all move around. You can get something very interesting called balance bond solids, where one example is one thing that I've already given you that you have basically a bunch of these uh, spin timers. And uh, they can all freeze together to make this valence bond solids. Now, in this valence bond solids, these are all dimers which freeze in place, but these dimers can be ferromagnetic dimers or antiferromagnetic dimers, and they can be up up spins pointing very different directions at in different times. So if you take a screenshot of this, if you take a snapshot of this at time one and a snapshot of this at time two, you will see that all these spins. Uh, even though these are all satisfied dimers, they all face very different directions. So that's a, basically an example of a balance bond solid, and you basically can get various kinds of balance bond solids if you have like a spin ladder. It was all introduced by Duncan Holding, um, uh, the kinds of the balance bond solids that you get, and also Phil Anderson. And then, very interestingly, you get another state of matter called the quantum spin liquids, where you have you don't have just this spin dimers. You have you can have spin dimers spanning very long range distances. You can have this spin forming a spin dimer with that spin, this spin forming a spin dimer with that spin, and then you basically have very long range entanglement and short range correlation, and so uh, you can actually have quasi particles in this system. So these are some of the most interesting states of matter that you can find, and some and the excitations of this. Uh, quantum spin liquids are also very topological in nature, which is something that I will uh, come to. So, so what are these quantum spin liquids? In quantum spin liquids, uh, what we have is basically a disordered set of spins, which looks disordered, but uh, they're not quite fully disordered. But what is most important is that they have very long range uh, dimer-like interactions, and they can be protected by uh, triplet gap. So all these spins are basically entangled. So the directions are all disordered, and you get very highly degenerate crown states, but the motions somehow are all very ordered. And, and how do you understand that? You understand that like this. So 
in a in a normal liquid, what happens is that, for example, if you just throw a stone in water, um, you form waves. Now the water molecules themselves are all moving around in all kinds of random directions, yet the interactions between them are strong enough that they still form waves, even though they are all moving randomly around. And that's something very similar which happens here is that even though the spin directions can all be random, uh, they still form these wave-like patterns. They still have very orderly motions. And since the motions are very orderly, the dynamics are very important and you see their signatures in things like spectroscopy or in transport, which are all dynamic, uh, are very dynamic uh, uh, probes. And, uh, this and this dynamics can also be very exciting. For example, you can have ordered motions which look like vortices or anti-vortices, and you get all kinds, all new kinds of excitations in these states of matter. And so uh, one experimental platform of quantum spin liquid is that of geometric frustration, which is something that I already told you about. It's a triangle, triangular motif, but that's not the only one which exists. You can have exchange frustration and you have uh, material examples of all of them. You can have exchange frustration, something I will go into in a lot more detail. Uh, you can have uh, something like a mix between a geometric and exchange frustration, and you can actually make um, networks like uh, organics and uh, metal organic frameworks where you can basically tailor the frustration inside your system. Shastri Sunderland lattice would be one example of a network based frustrating model. And spin liquids is a very hot topic. As you could see, if I <laughs> plot the number of publications uh, every year as a function of um, number of publications by year, it kind of seems that it is kind of going up the roof. And uh, and the reason why it is going up the roof is because uh, these spin liquids uh, give rise to uh, a very peculiar kind of uh, behavior, which is that it can produce something called quasi particles. What are quasi particles? Quasi particles are basically the effective motions of the spins. They behave in such a way that uh, a groups of spins behave in a way as if it behaves like one single quantum particle. And so these effective particles are called quasi particles and they come because of how the spins are all mo are moving. And these quasi particles can have various kinds of behavior. And uh, one example of quasi particle is of course the Marana fermion. There can be anions, there can be direct fermions, wild fermions, so a whole bunch of them. And one example of course is the Marana fermion, which uh, many of us know here, it's uh, basically a quasi particle which is its own antimatter uh, so which what that means is that if you basically have some energy you, you can create marana fermions just by giving it some the material some energy you basically get a positive and a negative except for that here the positive is equal to the negative so they're their own antimatter and then they can annihilate back to give you back some energy. So these have been long studied in high energy physics, but in uh, these spin systems and in charge systems, they do uh, arise as fractionalized quasi particles. Uh, and uh, they can be trapped into Marana bound states. And they show anionic statistics if they are gapped, and they can produce, uh, they can actually produce a recipe for decoherence free quantum qubits, which is basically the rationale for the Microsoft. Uh, Q station, they have been really working on it. So, uh, so these are, um, so that's what this uh, one example of these quasi particles. They, they, it's not the only example, by the way. There are many more examples. I'll come to that. So, um, to get into a little bit more detail of how we can get this Marana quasi particles out of this Kitab spin liquid. So, this Kitab spin liquid is basically composed of three different bonds this J1, J2, J3, all of which are Ising interactions. So J1 is Ising, J2 is Ising, J3 is Ising, but all of these three Ising interactions point in different directions in space. What that means is that the spin, which is right in the middle, is kind of frustrated because the J3 bond wants to pull it in one direction, J J1 wants to pull it in a second, J2 wants to pull it in a third. So now if you consider a whole lattice, like a honeycomb lattice, you see that a honeycomb lattice is is a is one of these y's and an inverted y or y and an inverted y so on and so forth. All these uh, spins are now frustrated, which means that now they form all these uh, spin dimers that we just talked about, these Ising spin dimers, 
And it's just not one state of one solution that you get. It's basically a combination of several such possible spin dimer solutions. For example, here you have a dimer on this bond, while here you have a dimer on this one and not on this one. And these are all viable solutions. And if you have a high degree of quantum fluctuation, then the system basically keeps on jumping from one of these degenerate ground states to the other. So everything is very mobile. So this is basically an example of a quantum spin liquid state. And what uh, Alexi Kitai showed back in 2006 is that you can actually rewrite this problem completely in a basis of static and in, in, in the basis of localized and itinerant Marana fermions. Uh, what, I mean, in his brilliance, what he found is that uh, there is an emergent Z2 symmetry which arises because of something called a plaquette operator. If you take all these six spins at the six corners of a honeycomb and then you multiply all of them, you basically get a conserved quantity which is either plus one or minus one. So this is the the plaquette operator or the flux operator. So it's it's almost like saying that you have either a vortex or an anti-vortex which will form in these systems. And uh, then using that, he was able to break the whole uh, Hamiltonian up into and rewrite it in the basis of Marana fermions. And he was able to show that the excitations are basically Marana fermions. And there are two types of excitations. One are the gapless Marana fermions and another is uh, the gauge fluxes or the y zones. And not going into too much detail, I will tell you is that he not only solved the phase diagram, he basically showed in which part of the phase diagram you would get abelian and in which part of the phase diagram you would get non-abelian excitations. And if you apply a small amount of uh, magnetic field, what happens is that these gauge fluxes and marana fermions start to interact with each other Using, uh, through this field. I mean, this, this field kind of acts as a gluon and that gaps out the spectrum. And below the spectrum, now you get this uh, quantized edge modes. And, uh, you, and you also get four different kinds of quasi-particles in the system. You basically get some bulk gap bosons, which are trivial, which are basically like magnons. And then you get some bulk gap emergent, excuse me, marana fermions. You get this gapless edge modes, which are the half quantized chiral marana fermions, and you also get this bulk gap ising non abelian anions, which are very exciting. I mean, because uh, we don't have too many platforms that can give anions, which are neither fermions nor bosons, uh, somewhere right in between. And uh, the way you, and, and what it turns out is that you also get these edge modes, and these edge modes basically. Uh, whenever, and this whole system has a non-zero churn number, which means that you will have these edge modes. And there is a, actually a fierce research which is going on right now in order to study and control these quasi-particles, both using transport and spectroscopy and other techniques. The question is that, what are these edge modes? Can we see it in a real material? And can we actually use these edge modes? Does these edge modes carry the same kind of wave functions as these non-abelian anions? Which means that, can we take these edge modes and can uh, can these edge modes act as a handle on my mar on, on my anions and uh, can we control each other through these edge modes? So basically, the, those are the kinds of research which are going on. And so basically, once you get these anions, these anions do not commute. So if you break them, you can create yet new kinds of operations. So in this uh, Kitab's quantum spin liquids, you basically get the uh, bosonic sectors, which is basically vacuum. You get the fermionic sector and the vortex sector. These are the super selector, the super selection sectors. Again, not going into too much detail. What you basically have is that you get this fluxes and then you get this, uh, this localized fluxes and then, then you get this marana fermions which kind of move all over the place and which also produce your uh, edge modes. And uh, and these fluxes, when they bind to the marana fermions, give you this anions, which essentially what, what, what it means is that you can take these anions, if you can find out a way to take these anions and break them, either you can break them physically or you can break them um, using uh, teleportation based techniques or some other techniques where you don't have to physically break them one across the other. You can actually do some mathematics. Um, you ha actually have to do do some kind of uh, um, manipulation on your material so that even if you don't take these anions physically and you move them across each other, it still 
it does the same kind of mathematics as braiding, then what you find is that you can actually use this to make uh, new kinds of protected quantum gates. Um, so that's basically a research direction which is going on and is a very hot research topic right now. So um, then, then we come to this point that, OK, fine. What I have all, say, all been saying so far is all fine in theory, but how does it all work in practice? So how do we measure the spin dynamics? So to measure the spin dynamics, uh, so if you have some magnons, you will have something like the spin wave modes, which is basically a motion of the spins, this wave-like motions of the spins. But you can also have something which is very uh, exotic, like this vortex and anti-vortex states. It turns out that what you have to do is to measure the spin-spin correlations. And the spin-spin correlations is something that you can measure using several techniques like neutron scattering, Riggs, Raman, terahertz, RPES, spin RPES, ESR. Here I will be talking a little bit more about neutron scattering, something that we do in a national lab. In a neutron scatter, the way neutron scattering works is that if you have an incident neutron, you hurl it towards a sample and then an exit neutron comes out. If you know the incident energy and the momentum of the incident neutron and you know the final energy and momentum, you can pretty much figure out what the scattering matrix is. And that scattering matrix has all the telltale information about, about um, the scattering cross-section and the scattering matrix has all the information about these excitations. So neutrons have a mass, so that it has a de Borg wavelength. So you can actually look at the atomic correlations using neutrons, but neutrons also have a magnetic moment. So the magnetic moment of a neutron interacts with the magnetic moment of your sample. So uh, from the way the neutrons are scattering, the, mag the magnetic, these magnet neutrons are basically like bar magnets themselves. And so how this neutron is scattering across the magnetic sample basically gives you the spin-spin correlations inside a material. So to get you in a little bit more detail, uh, what do neutrons really measure? It measures the magnetic scattering cross-section. So basically this is the whole equation. Don't be afraid, I can break it down for you. Basically, if you have two spins at two locations, which is alpha and beta, then what, it, what you really measure is this whole is this whole function here. So it con consists of, it's called the neutron scattering cross-section. It consists of some constants. It consists of something called the magnetic form factor, which is a very important term, which helps us separate what is magnetic and what is not. So it helps us separate between a magnetic scattering and a phonon-based scattering. We have some uh, we have some selection rules which says that only perpendicular components of the spin contribute, and this is also a very important term because if you are doing neutron scattering on a certain material, it tells you which direction the spins are pointing. But the most important term is the Fourier transform of the spin-spin correlation function, which is uh, which is uh, which contains all the telltale signatures of uh, uh, the dynamics. Is the so the, the place where we do the, all these experiments is in a national lab, which basically this is an example of, uh, um, this is the picture of the Oak Ridge National Lab. And I can go into a lot more detail on what it is. You can see that it is in the beautiful backdrop of the Smoky Mountains uh, and the Appalachian Range. Basically what it consists of is a linear accelerator. You basically accelerate a proton at a very high energy it goes in through an accumulator ring and then it impinges on a mercury target and it produces neutrons on all sides and uh, you basically have moderators and you have like flat geometry mirrors which focus the neutrons and waveguides which focus the neutrons onto various materials and you can see that you have various instrument instruments all around this target so you have a total of 18 instruments all around this target and this is where we do these experiments. The way you apply for beamline there is that we have uh, uh, neutron proposal deadlines twice every year and you have to work with somebody who is an expert on these neutron scattering techniques and you can apply for neutron beam time and if you write a good enough proposal then you will get like anywhere between two to seven days or even more a month of beam time where you can go in there and you can uh, study your material using the neutron beams at these locations. So uh, you not only do it here, you can also do these experiments at the high flux isotope reactor, which is also close by 
from these pollution neutron source, which is basically a reactor based uh, neutron source. This is the large scale facilities where you do this uh, experiments. One of the basic things about working in this large scale facilities is that you have to be very uh, outgoing and talk with people. They have everything. I mean, if you need an expert who is uh, an expert on something like halite chemistry, or you know, if you need an expert who is an expert on, let's say, some weird kind of measurement, I think that you will find a person, person in, in a national facility. But you just have to talk and figure out and uh, make them interested on your science, and you have to be very outgoing. So. It's an extremely collaborative atmosphere uh, working there, so it is very different from the how we are used to working sometimes in uh, in an university where every professor is kind of doing his own little his own thing. Here, everybody is almost involved in every kind of science, and it you basically form teams depending on the kind of problems that you have, and because you can have various kinds of expertise, people from various kind of expertise working together on the same team, you can do projects which you cannot do in a university. And that's one of the advantages of working in a national lab and of working with a national lab that uh, you can get very challenging projects done uh, if you're working with a national lab. So uh, there are several uh, instruments there. Uh, for example, you have triple axis spectrometers. Uh, basically, these are spectrometers where you have a monochromator and an analyzer where you basically look at the uh, energy of the energy dispersion of a sample. So you can both select the, you, you basically get both the information about the uh, energy loss as well as the momentum loss. How? From the monochromator and the analyzer, you get information about the EI and the EF, which is the incident energy and the final energy and the your final uh, omega is basically EF minus EI, and from the incident momentum and the final momentum, it depends on this angle here, you can basically select Q. Basically, you get information in all uh, energy momentum. You get the entire four-dimensional energy momentum tensor, information in the entire four-dimensional energy momentum tensor from some of these instruments. Another instrument that we have used is the time of light spectrometer. As you can see, this is a man. This is a staircase. This is where you put your sample. Neutron beams come and uh, with an incident momentum Ki gets uh, diffracted and uh, hits this detector drum, which is at Kf. So where this neutron hits gives you the momentum. And when this neutron hits there, gives you the omega. So, and that is basically called the time of flight uh, way of detecting, uh, of doing neutron scattering. And this is something where, which I can go into a lot more detail if you have some question, I can talk with you offline on this. So the way you do, do is that you get, you basically have a 2D detector, but um, so you basically get only two dimensions of momentum from this 2D detector. You basically reconstruct the third dimension by taking one of the samples. So here you see basically a sample uh, mounted on on this aluminum fins, you take the sample and you basically rotate the sample. And for each rotation, basically, you get one of the slices of the third dimension. And this way, you can basically regenerate your uh, three dimensional reciprocal space uh, image from a two dimensional detector. You basically, you do what is almost like a tomography. And in conventional magnets, what you basically get are magnons and phonons. And this is how they look. This is how it looks in the real space. And if you look at it in the Fourier space, this is energy versus momentum. They basically look like this cone-like shapes of dispersion. And this is basically energy. This is momentum. And this is basically what I'm showing here is real data from a certain material. And these are momentum in some in-plane axis. You see that if you make a cut right here, these are cones. If you cut right along a cone, basically what you get is this circular ring-like shapes. And those are how phonons or magnons really look like. These are magnons coming from some long range ferromagnetic order or anti ferromagnetic order. And then when you go up and up, you make a cut at a higher energy, these phonon modes or magnon modes actually become larger and larger. So this is how uh, distortions look from phonons or magnons, which are essentially bosons. However, um, so they produce very sharp features. However, if you have a fluctuating moment, you will get very broad features. Why? 
because uh, if in the real space your spin-spin correlations are long-lived, you will get a very sharp feature, but if it is short-lived, which means that your fluctuations are higher, you will get very broad features in energy. So basically, your real space and Fourier space are kind of conjugate of each other. So something which is long-lived and unfluctuating in the real space will have a very sharp feature in the reciprocal space, and something which is fluctuating will have a very broad feature in the reciprocal space. And same for correlation length and correlation time. I mean, something with uh, long range correlations have very sharp features like drag peaks, while short range correlations have uh, uh, very broad features. So using this, we can find out what is fluctuating and what is not. And we can also figure out whether things are, are fractionalized or not. For example, if you have a spin, spin, if you have a spin one chain and basically one spin flips, and now you have basically a domain wall, which each of these carries an effective spin charge of half. So basically a spin one has effectively fractionalized into two spin half solidons. What is, how does the dispersion of that look like? So this is energy, this is momentum. The dispersion looks like this broad continuum of scattering, which is bounded by these meniscus of, uh, this is uh, antiferromagnet and this is that of a ferromagnet and you get this bound sorry, this broad scattering in between these two meniscus. And that's exactly what you kind of go and measure. If you go and measure a material which has this kind of a Hamiltonian, you get this broad uh, broad features that you can measure in energy and momentum. And uh, people have measured this all over the place. So um, how, what exactly do we, how, uh, how so that's all fine. So um, we know how to measure this now. So how do we really get to the right material? So that's also a lot of challenge. And, and as it turns out, I will give you the example of a Kitak material, which uh, I just told you about. In, so in a Kitak material, the prerequisite is that you have to have this honeycomb, you have to have this honeycomb shape. So basically it has to be a honeycomb material. And you also have to have this weird p dive interaction. So that means that this bond, this bond, and this bond all have to face different directions. The way it is possible is if you have a very high spin orbit coupling and you have an octahedral cage of uh, anion, anions, basically an octahedral cage of some element, uh, which basically, as you see that uh, if you have a metallic cation here and you have an octahedral cage of anions, then what happens is that this is a square, this is a square, and that is a square, and all these three squares basically face three different directions in space. And somehow, if you have high spin orbit coupling, you can show that all the Heisenberg interactions cancel out, and you are just left with these three dive interactions, which face three different directions in space. So those are the kind of requirements that you have. You have to hide have high spin orbit coupling, you have to have edge sharing octahedra, and you have to have a spin of ground state. And you have to have a honeycomb uh, coordination of the cation. So there you are, I mean, a lot of, um, uh, you basically have a laundry list of uh, things that you have to kind of uh, match up. But it's, it turns out that there are several materials which, uh, which have these characteristics. Like the like the alkali ion iridates or the alkali ion uh, rutnates is one great example where people have seen that they have a very high kit of interaction of 40 MeV. And then my own uh, red, my own uh, um, experiments on alpha ruthenium trichloride essentially show that these have a kit of interactions of 7 to 16 MeV. Now. Uh, sodium iridate, of course, has a much higher kit of interaction of 40 MeV, and ruthenium trichloride has much lower, 7 to 16 MeV. Yet, somehow, we have found working with the ruthenium trichloride much easier because somehow these single crystals are not air sensitive, while these are very air sensitive. And, uh, and the experimental bottleneck here is that it is very difficult to form very nice single crystals of sodium iridate, while it is possible to make very nice single crystals of ruthenium chloride, which is why we have been much more successful with this system. Now, synthesis of ruthenium chloride was a big challenge. We basically had to uh, burn some ruthenium. And so basically, when we bought ruth uh, ruthenium trichloride from the market, it was 
a mess. They sell you ruthenium trichloride saying that, look, we are giving you good ruthenium trichloride, but turns out that it has ruthenium oxychloride, ruthenium oxide, all kinds of mess. So we had to basically start from scratch and we basically took an oxygen, the, a chlorine cylinder and we started to burn some of this ruthenium in chlorine and that's how we got the best ruthenium trichloride and that's how we were able to get to some of the best crystals. Now this is also a kind of research which is sometimes can be very tricky in uh, in a university but in a national lab you have people who are experts on glass blowing and experts on halide chemistry and they can you can basically create a team of people who can help you to get some of these experiments done and uh, set, set up something as complicated as uh, doing some chlorine burning on some meadow, which was really necessary for making these very nice samples. So basically you get, uh, after some very difficult halide synthesis, we got large single crystals, which are very two-dimensional because you get a 2D, 2D dy order in them. They are very nice MOT insulators and you get pretty strong spin orbit coupling as we could see in scanning tunneling spectroscopy measurements, almost uh, 200 MeV. And in this material, when we did neutron scattering, we figured out that it has a very rich phase diagram where if you look at temperature versus field, it goes from a zigzag antiferromagnetic state through a spin reorientation to a gapless spin liquid phase to a gapped spin liquid phase. And we were able to kind of track all of that down. So in at low temperature and low field, you have some gapped bosons, which are these magnons, and then you have the spin ons at higher energies. And then here the gap closes at around six Tesla, and then a new gap reopens at uh, low temperatures and low energies at eight Tesla, where you really would expect what we think is the quantum spin liquid phase. And this new opening of this tiny gap here, if you squint your eyes, is basically what we think is happening here is that we are basically opening up a non-abelian gap below which you should expect this non-abelian edge moves. And uh, long and behold, uh, that's what basically people discovered. They were able to, people got motivated from the experiments that we did with neutrons and they were able to find this very nice half integer quantized Hall plateau it was published in Nature in 2018, right at eight Tesla where they measured the thermal Hall effect as a function of field, and they found this very nice plateau, uh, which is exactly half quantized, which shows that you have Marana fermions uh, in the system. It is one of the direct uh, uh, measurements of Marana fermion dead states in this system. And they also were able to show that depending on which direction you apply the field in this material, you can basically move the churn number from plus one and minus one, and it can also go to trivial states and, and uh, you can get a large number of states. So there is a lot of research going on right now. For example, here with Yang Chen, we are trying to do a platinum RUCL3 bilayer for spin hole magnet resistance measurements. We are trying to do STM measurements, both here and at Oak Ridge National Lab, and also trying to make graphene RUCL3 heterostructures and understand uh, what kind of quantum oscillations that you get. And is it possible to actually change the properties of graphene or the properties of ruthenium trichloride by slapping them right on top of each other and uh, then gating them? And th these are kind of uh, technologically relevant measurements that, you, that we are trying to do in order to understand um, how to work with the systems in the device geometry. So uh, there are several future challenges. Of course, one of them is how to make uh, qubits out of these materials. And uh, I'm going a little bit fast here because there is a small section I also want to cover in the last five minutes. So, so there is a huge amount of excitement which people are also uh, on making quantum point contacts where you basically can interfere these edge modes to figure out uh, to get a direct handle on this non-abelian statistic and this non-abelian quasi-particles and trying to see if there is a way we can uh, confirm all the fusion rules of this non-abelian quasi-particles. So uh, there is, so with that I will quickly switch gears and I will come to the other part which is on quantum algorithms. So, um, so quantum magnets are actually ideal for benchmarking quantum computers. And I'll try to explain you what I mean by that. So basically the spins that I was just talking about um, can 
point in any direction in the blocks block space. And they have some very interesting characteristics. First is that the block spins can be directly mapped into the qubits in a quantum computer because uh, through something called the phase gate. Basically, the phase gate is same as uh, the uh, theta and chi of the block sphere. So you have a one-to-one -one mapping between your spin states in a material and the qubits in a quantum computer. So it's a very nice one-to-one -one mapping, which we can take advantage of. And the second thing is that in a quantum, in a quantum computer, two such spins are very easy to entangle, which is it looks looks like the dimer state that we had just talked about, and they, they are very easy to embed in one of these quantum machines. So then the question is that can we actually look at entangled dynamics using these quantum machines? And uh, once we get this uh, entangled dimer pairs, can we make them into a chain? And from a chain, can we make them into more complex shapes like plaquettes to this quantum spin liquids to the point that we are we can actually start and measure some of this dynamic data. So the way you do it is that if you have a mag model Hamiltonian, the first thing that you have to do is the ground state preparation to get to a ground state configuration. And once you get to the ground state configuration, there are several ways to do it, like simulate and editing and have a state preparation, variational quantum eigensolver, phase estimation algorithm. Once you get your ground state, you have to evolve it via Suzuki trotter operations or some other way to get into this long range entangled motions, which you have to classical Fourier transform to the dynamic properties. And this is basically one cycle that we can run using these quantum computers in order to understand our materials, because then you basically get a model which you can directly compare with the experiments. The problem that we have so far is that we have noise. So we have qubit noise, which basically bef befuddles our ground state. It also befuddles our long range integral motions. But I will also tell you is that it's not a um, complete showstop because we also have noise, thermal and instrumental noise in our own experiments. So some of that we can actually probably beneficially use some of the noise that we have in the qubits to understand the noise in these systems. So to at least produce some kind of a one-to-one -one mapping. Some, some very interesting research which we are starting to undergo in that. So um, so I don't have time for this today, but uh, we actually did some very nice uh, measurements of, uh, we actually used the DBA quantum computer to uh, figure out the ground state of one of these frustrated Hamiltonians called the Shastri Sunderland lattice. And I can go into that in more detail for those who are interested, just very briefly. This is the phase diagram, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, which was published by Liu and Satchdev in PRL in 2008 and then Dublinek in 2012. And that's exactly what we got when we uh, tried to solve it using DBEC, which is uh, very nice, which means that we have a new way to kind of look at these states. And not only that, we were also able to get into the critical phases between the ferromagnetic and the plateau phase and the nil phase. Uh, through the and we were able to see some of these fluctuations, which is this broad shoulders that you would be able to see. So, uh, some very interesting research there. Of course, I don't have time. And um, and again, for those who are interested, we are embarking on a research to understand the spin dynamics of a magnetic Hamiltonian using the IBM quantum computer. And but that's a completely different topic for another day. And uh, with that, I will come to the conclusions today, which is that uh, new ground states and excited states are possible uh, in quantum magnets. And, uh, and there are several new states of matter which we can access, which we cannot access uh, in uh, if we don't have quantum entanglement. And uh, so several new exotic states of matter. And then the question is that how can we use some of the states of matter in order to uh, in order to, how can we use some of these states of matter in order to uh, make new devices and make new sensors and make, make new kinds of quantum computers? Uh, for example, lossless information transfer, spin liquids and spin ices are great for lossless information transfer um, because of this long range entangled states. They are great for making new states of matter like uh, spin superfluidity. How can we use all of these states? And also, I think that uh, I just gave you a little bit of flavor of working in this large scale facilities, which offer several plethora of methods 
which are available via proposals and through collaborations, which we should be trying to take advantage of. And with that, I will end today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arnab, for the introduction and great overview of your research. It was very interesting, and I think it was also important to show a lot of opportunities for collaboration. Uh, I think we have a question already from the audience, uh, Professor Shalayev. Shalayev, you're muted. You're muted. No, I guess not. Okay, now you're not. So, so well, uh, thank you for a really wonderful lecture. I mean, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. The, as uh, you pointed out, um, uh, how important for uh, these topological qubits, uh, uh, these non-abelian anions. And as, of course, you know, there is still no uh, unambiguous demonstration of uh, some physical system which would act as uh, non-abelian anion-based uh, qubit. So you mentioned also a number of various materials, Majorana, these uh, gapped spin liquids, and in literature, for example, they also discuss now like non-abelian optics. What's your opinion as an expert? Uh, what material platform uh, to you looks most promising? Of course, we should try all of them and physics is exciting for all of them. But maybe you have some intuition in terms of which material platform is most promising for realizing these topological qubits based on which have this non-abelian anion property. So, um, what you asked is basically a million dollar question. It's literally a million dollars because when we answer that question well, we will get a million dollars to do the uh, research. So, uh, my feeling is that we have to uh, look at the basic nature of these materials and what are the prime ingredients that we need to satisfy. So, we need to satisfy magnetic frustration, which is very important. And there are several, several ways in which we can get magnetic frustration and some of these longer range entangled ground states. And I, I just, I mostly concentrated on the honeycomb lattice and the triangular lattice here, but you can get like square lattice, you can get like other kinds of lattices. So, um, so the frustration is the key and uh, frustration actually enhances uh, quantum entanglement and uh, lets us uh, gives us kind of a window to see them and so that's one of the most important things that we have to do the other thing uh, that we have to do is understand is that uh, these are emergent these are emergent processes what it means is that a single spin or a single charge is probably not important as much as what is the collective behavior so Essentially, we have to find a way in which we are interrogating not just one spin or one charge. We have to find a way in which we are interrogating more than one spin, more than one charge. And those are the kind of, uh, and then we can basically say that, aha, uh -huh, this is basically the amount of entanglement between these two systems, or we have an overall emergent state which is arising, which is long range entangled. So th this is where, very broadly speaking, we should put our money on. More specifically, I think that uh, there is a large plethora of 2D frustrated magnets that we should really examine very carefully. And uh, especially looking at things which can be exfoliated, which can be put into like thin films and made devices on, on which one can do like maybe two NV center probes or double STM probes or SPN probes. And uh, and also, of course, there's uh, large scale uh, scattering techniques are of course there. And then there is one, one more very interesting development which is happening, which is something that I wanted to tell you about, and I never got the chance, which is a new research which has come out of IBM. And this person who is leading this research uh, spoke, spoke with us, which is where he basically took this STM tip and he moved some spin half titanium atoms close together to see what happens. And what he found is that he was able to produce a bound state he was able to produce the spin dimer states, uh, this uh, entangled state, just by bringing these titanium atoms very close together so that these spins lose their individual identity and then they become this nice 
uh, tiny dimers, and then they were able to kind of start to play around with it, and then they were able to kind of make this uh, large uh, lattices of these tiny spin half dimers and make it into a quantum spin liquid. And this was just published in uh, Nature Communications. Uh, and uh, so, so, and the reason why they are trying to look at these systems, this is a completely artificial system where you can also get a spin liquid. And the, the reason why they're trying to look at the systems is because they get the spin superfluidity. They are trying to look for spin superfluidity and the lossless information transfer. So there is more than one ways in which we can try and look at these systems. This is both in an emergent fashion and then in a real material in a much in a slightly reductionist fashion. So that that's my broad answer. Of course, it was provocative question. So if somebody would know the answer. <laughs> My only correction, uh, it's not a million dollar question. It's a multi, multi billion dollar question. <laughs> but thank you, thank you. Yeah, it's a billion dollar question, yes. <laughs> yeah. And just, uh, just uh, since uh, there are lots of students, postdocs involved, and uh, we need to think out of box, we know that there are like two parallel uh, approaches for quantum computing, like IBM, Google from one side, and let's say this recently demonstrated quantum supremacy based on uh, photons, uh, uh, sources of uh, indistinguishable photons and boson sampling, basically photon based. Uh, I'm bringing all this up because there is some activity on this uh, non-abelian optics. So I'm just wondering whether we could think of uh, developing topological quantum computing photonic space. So it's uh, if I be, if I knew the answer, <laughs> I would get this billion dollar. But I'm just suggesting uh, folks to think about this. So on the same note, I will actually uh, I think that you certainly know about this research which came up in science, which is the topological laser. And uh, oh, it's not laser. It's not what I what you're talking about is topological insulator based laser. Right. I mean, from what you group. No, it's more like uh, uh, Maran Salyacic from MID. They mm -hmm. actually uh, mimicked uh, non abelian Indians uh, uh, with uh, uh, with optics. So and they demonstrated that it, 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 it acts like this non commutating uh, optical system. And it's not the only paper. If you do some search, there are several papers. They're all very, very recent. And they all built around this uh, non-abelian uh, optics. It's somewhat related to topological insulators because they're both based on this uh, H-state, topologically protected. But uh, it's not what uh, you mentioned. It might be related, but it's something else. Yes. Uh, basically, I'm suggesting we should be open for some unexpected developments, perhaps. Oh, absolutely. I think that this is a very dynamic field. And uh, I think that Ed states, the concept of Ed states kind of transcends all the fields. Even uh, in, in my talk, as you realized, I have this connection with the Ed states. Um, but uh, but uh, that's a very interesting development. I really have to read up on that. And thanks for attracting my attention. Right, it's uh, Maran Salyacic, 2019 Science. You could start with this, but there are also uh, other papers. And it's just in the title, Non-Abelian Optics, basically. Ah, I'll definitely look that up. And uh, then we should discuss, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, let's see if we have uh, one more short uh, comment or question from the audience. So if anyone would like to add something, please do it now. If that's not the case, I would like to thank you again, Arnab, for joining our seminar and giving a great talk. Uh, we all enjoy it a lot. And I, if you don't mind, I will uh, send also in a follow up email to all students your email. So it seems uh, they may have more questions and would like to join you about uh, your research and uh, maybe possible collaboration. Oh, absolutely. I would be, I would love, love that. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Goodbye. You.